Welcome to another episode of Teen Gen Talks, hosted by me, Melissa. And me, Desiree. Where the goal is to empower the youth of Glendale and connect youth to community resources, individuals, and organizations through interviews and discussions. And today we are joined by a special guest, Teresa Flores. Teresa is an interdisciplinary artist whose work examines identity and wellness and often takes place in the public sphere and incorporates civic engagement. Her studio practice includes drawing, painting, and video. Currently, she is an official artist in residence for the city of Los Angeles. Teresa has presented her work at Los Angeles County Museum of Art, Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego, and Spike Art Quarterly in Berlin. Her work has been published in Alta Journal and mentioned in The New Yorker. She holds an MFA in public practice from Otis College of Art and Design. Don't forget to follow us on our socials on Instagram and Facebook at MyGlendaleLAC. Don't forget to also listen to us on Spotify or Apple or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Also make sure to give us a like and subscribe to the YouTube channel Glendale Library Arts and Culture where we post full videos every Friday at 4.30 p.m. Thank you, Teresa, for taking the time out of your day to talk with us. We have a lot to discuss. So to start off the interview, um, do you remember a specific moment when you fell in love with art in general? Okay, this is a good start here. Um, <laughs> when did I fall in love? I mean, there's been like moments. It's, it's definitely a relationship. Yeah. Um, fell in love with it. Oh, I believe that would be at some point when I was going to Fresno City College and I was taking figure drawing. And um, just the, the way that I would feel after class um, it was like, wow, this is, this is something that I want in my life. You know, this is something that I want to continue doing and making and, and practicing. Um, so that was like very early on, you know, in, in my baby mm -hmm. artist days. You're also an interdisciplinary artist. Can you let everyone at home know what artist that is? Okay. Uh, so interdisciplinary. So I work around ideas, but I wouldn't call myself like a conceptual artist because I, um, I move between things like drawing and painting or making videos or even sometimes performance um, into things like social practices. So that would be like working with people to make art or uh, create things. So I have different sets of skills that I can draw from. So that's why mm -hmm. I say interdisciplinary, but also I've been kind of rethinking that and like, what's another way to say this? So <laughs> fluid. Um, so going back to your education days, uh, you hold an MFA in public practice from Otis College of Arts and Design and a BA in art drawing and painting from Cal State Fresno. What was your education journey like and how did you know that pursuing an MFA was the right choice for you? Whoa. Oh, man. I, getting an MFA was a really a hard decision that I struggled with for uh, of a few years before I did it because um, I studied for a long time at like Fresno City College, just kind of like taking my time to get through school and really thinking about like, what do I want to do? What do I want my career to be? And uh, when I eventually did transfer to Fresno State and I was really like, this is it, I'm studying art, I'm gonna be an artist. I was like, I live in Fresno. How am I going to be an artist in Fresno? How, how am I gonna like sustain myself? You know, what am I gonna do? And um, there was the, the terminal degree in art is an MFA, a master's of fine art. Otherwise you can get a master's in art, an MA, uh, which Fresno State offered. But I realized that to do the things that I wanted to do, I needed to get more skills and like get the MFA, which meant that I would have to leave the Central Valley because there was no way of, uh, there was nowhere to get an MFA in the Central Valley. So, so yeah, that decision, it wasn't just like, let me get my master's degree. It was like, I have to actually leave home and go somewhere, which a lot of people are like really, you know, excited to do that kind of thing. But it, for me, it was like, I was like in a relationship and like raising kids. And like, I had like a whole community of people that I was working with. And, you know, it was, it was like 
just totally being uprooted. It really just kind of made sense eventually where I knew that I just, I needed to get the skills and by coming to LA and going to Otis, I would also be able to reconnect with my family in Southern California because I'm originally from there. So, um, so yeah, just to be able to, um, reconnect with my family, spend time with my grandpa and go to grad school. It was like, okay, this, this makes sense. This feels like the right thing to do. And what did, what did you learn during that transition that kind of maybe helped you, you know, pursue it even more or like helped you feel better about yourself, like leaving your, your home? Yeah. Wow. Um, I learned a lot. It, it was actually, it was such a culture shock and it was such a, a change and I had so much resistance to it, even while I was like in it. Um, that it became something that what I examined as part of my thesis for my master's degree, it was the idea of like, what happens when you leave home, you know, um, and what happens when you go back home and, you know, how do you see people and how do you see the culture and your community and how do they see you from going back? And those were things that I started to explore, but yeah, it was, it was a lot of like personal growth and personal learning and, and having to really kind of be adaptive. I guess go touching upon that, how did you make sure that you didn't feel like kind of like like an outsider going back to Fresno? Because I feel like sometimes when you move away from home, mm-hmm. you got accustomed to like the new lifestyle and everything. So then once you come back home, you kind of feel like a guest. You don't feel, mm-hmm. you know, kind of mm-hmm. like the same homey feeling. I mean, it's not the same for everyone, but how did you maintain that, I guess, connection with Fresno? In some ways, even though I physically wasn't there, like I was still there. And a lot of that has to do with um, just the the connections that I built before I left Um, and even with social media. So like I've been gone from that area for like 10 or more years, but probably if I, if I get on social media, like half the people I'm talking to are in Fresno and the Central Valley, like still. So uh, it was, it was something where it was like, I genuinely have that love and connection with my community. And I just kept it up, like have kept it up for all of these years. Um, and so for feeling like an outsider, I mean, in some ways you, you can't avoid that just because you are geographically distanced and things do change over time, you know, nothing's gonna like stay the same but you know I feel like just kind of understanding that like you're kind of positioning like you know where you are with your community and like how you feel about them and maybe how they feel about you if you can get that that helps. Do you have any advice that you would give anyone wanting to pursue interdisciplinary art? Well I mean you can just I feel like trusting in your process because if you're working interdisciplinary interdisciplinarily um then you're you're picking up a lot of skills and you're using them in different ways so you know you might spend a year or two focused on just like one medium you know but you can still practice things on the side or you just don't have to necessarily feel like you abandon things you know you're you're living your life as an artist and you can shift So I don't feel like that's something to stress too much about. Yeah. Your projects, Experimental Quesadilla Lab and Fresen Yoga are some examples of you using your lens of your Chicana identity and California roots. Um, How did you come up with these projects and made sure to represent your identity in them? Um, Well, they both came from from like within, from my own experiences and wanting to, knowing that what I was experiencing wasn't like a soul thing, that I knew that there were other people out there. And so by like making those spaces, I felt like, you know, that might bring other folks to be talking about it. Because even then that was like kind of me reaching within my community. These were conversations I was already having with people and it was like, okay, now I'm, I'm developing these, these spaces around this for like imagining and finding ways to like move forward and develop the conversation. So Experimental Quesadilla Lab came up, um, it was part of the culture shock of grad school. Both of those were part of the culture shock of grad school. Moving from from like Fresno and the just different parts of Fresno. I didn't live in like 
I don't know, there's like fancy parts to Fresno, but then there's yeah. just like <laughs> middle class Fresno. And then, there's, you know, there's just, there's different parts of Fresno. Um, but from going from where I was to West LA was just like, where am I? Yeah. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Who are these people? How did they get here? <laughs> so, um, so, and then on top of that, being in grad school in West LA, it was just like, like this whole other world of people. So, um, in my first couple semesters there, we'd be sitting around these like really nice tables and we'd be having these talks about social practice and public art. And there was always, like cheese and crackers and grapes and hummus on the table and it was always like <laughs> you know what I'm talking about yeah <laughs> yes and so it was always like this very like nice spread of food and I was like what what's going on here <laughs> so um so I, the, the cheese was what, what most fascinated me because it was brie and I was just like cheese put mm-hmm. crust on it <laughs> I was like, what do you do? With this? <laughs> um, and so, you know, I got curious and I, I tried the cheese and stuff like that. And um, it was kind of like my gateway cheese where it was like, oh, like I've only been eating like the same two or three kinds of cheeses my whole life. <laughs> and I can try other, I can actually like go to the grocery store and pick one out and take it home and, and cook with it. But I didn't know what to do with it, you know? So I was like, I just make a quesadilla, right? Um, and so, yeah, I went to Trader Joe's and I like saw the, the weirdest cheese I could find at, to me at that point in time was um, this uh, blueberry goat cheese. And so, <laughs> cause I was like, why would you put blueberries on yeah. it? <laughs> yeah. And so I, I, I put it in a quesadilla cause I had no idea what to do with it otherwise. And I was like, this is pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> And um, I, I just kind of got to thinking about it, like, what does it mean culturally for me to do something like this, you know? Um, because I remember at the time talking with uh, my grad department, uh, the, the chair, the founder of the program, Suzanne Lacey, uh, she was, she's also from the Central Valley. And I was just telling her like, look, I'm really struggling here with this transition. She's like, it's a class transition. Like you're, you're moving like up in like, Mm. like social classes and this academic class. And that's why you're so resistant. And so I was like, okay, so if I put this fancy cheese in the quesadilla, then, you know, this is part of that class transition, you know, but it's also like me talking about the accessibility that I have to food, you know, the accessibility to like the gross, what's in the grocery stores around me, what my body can process. And then as I got deeper into things, I thought about like how, um, you know, not everybody can eat dairy, not everybody can eat gluten. And we wind up modifying things, but we still want to keep our culture. And we still want to eat food that's like delicious and feels true to us. And so that's, that's what the space of the experimental quesadilla lab is, is that we can um, imagine together we can experiment and you don't really have anything to lose. You didn't bring home some nasty block of cheese that you're never going to eat. Um, you know, you like, it's just, you're looking at also just what is in the neighborhood of wherever the lab is. So it's not like I brought in something from across town for you to try that you'll never be able to have. Like it's near in that space. There's a lot of ways to like enter that project and, and look at it. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's about, you know, it, it did come from like my own personal experiences. Also, brie cheese is very LA, like very LA. Because yes. if you go to like charcuterie boards or like friends come over, they always bring that cheese. I'm like, there's other cheeses, but okay. <laughs> there are. <laughs> like, I have discovered more. so many good cheeses since the project. <laughs> Do you have like a favorite cheese? Oh, man. Um... There was this cheese, it was like a manchego, but it had a different name and I can't remember what it is. It's been a long time. I, I, uh-huh. I like took a break from the cheeses, you know, like I, 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 you know, it helps when you have funding for the cheese. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so you also do workshops. How do you prepare for them? Has there been a favorite workshop that you've done? 
Uh, I know I've done so many workshops. Sometimes the workshops are like, just kind of like a one-time thing or a one-off or just like a pilot to see if it might turn into something else. Um, let me see, favorite workshops. Oh gosh, there are so many like, cause they all kind of tie into things. I have to say like working with Spanish Sin Pena has been something interesting. And in that process, Spanish Sin Pena is this online group that's based in LA online community that's based in LA. And there's there's people from across the country who um, are like, like of Spanish speaking families who have not learned to speak Spanish for one reason or another. And so um, it's kind of this space that they have to like practice and learn. And so that space has helped me a lot with my own like um, relationship with the Spanish language. Um, but I did a workshop with them where uh, we, I asked people from around the country basically to go and get some pan dulce and we painted a still life of it. And then we had a discussion about like their accessibility to pan dulce. And I learned a lot about just how this country kind of views Mexican food and where it's accessible and where, where people are really struggling and they have to make their own. Um, another one that I did, I don't know, there's just so many different things. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that was fun, that was fun. Um, another one was, it was part of an online exhibition during the quarantine called Acogedor, and it was a workshop called Kinda Chicana. And I invited folks from my community who don't speak Spanish or are learning to speak Spanish didn't grow up speaking Spanish to just come together and talk about like, how do you pronounce your name? Um, you know, how do I, how do you identify yourself? Um, you know, how do you, how do you like practice or maintain your culture? You know, even though you, you know, maybe people don't see you as like qualified enough to identify with this identity and things like that. Um, and that was a lot of fun. It was really meaningful to me. But preparing for things, I like to make flyers. That's kind of like the side practice that I do. Um, it kind of cracks me up and, and it just kind of feels, it feels good to just kind of package something up and be like, this is a thing. I want you to join me for it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I'll, I'll make the flyers and then I'll make like my itinerary, figure out what I have to do and figure out what I have to research, um, you know, all the things that I want to talk about. I like to try to keep track of time because like things go by really fast when you get into a workshop. You have also been an educator at Armory Center of the Arts, Fresno Art Museum and Otis College to name a few. What made you decide to venture into this avenue and did your background in being an educator help when doing your workshops? I didn't expect to become a teacher originally when I was studying art. How Suzanne Lacey explained it when I got to Otis was that, especially I guess in California, being an artist and being a teacher often go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And you need, uh, you kind of need both to support your practice in some ways. Like, you know, you have to have the teaching platform to, to stay financially stable. And then you have, you have, you know, your work you can do. It doesn't work out like that for everybody. Not everybody has like the energy and the health to do both at the same time. Mm -hmm. I started teaching as soon as I graduated from Fresno State. Like that was the first thing that I knew how to do. Otherwise, I probably, like the two options that appeared to me after I finished my undergrad at Fresno State and have had like an art degree, it was like, okay, well, I either teach or I start my own business. And I was like, I have no idea how to start my own business but I had no idea how to teach either. <laughs> there were more people who were like willing to teach me how to teach. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of like went into that and, and started learning about it and just really appreciating it, seeing the community aspect of it. Um, so when I started doing social practice, um, basically you're, you're like a teacher, but you're out in the community. You're, you're still teaching art, but you're like not in a classroom. And that's what I like about what I do is that like, I can still teach. I love teaching, but I don't have to be in a classroom. Can you also talk a little bit more about your recent public art projects, Art Moves and the Guided Snack Hour? Art Moves was something that I dreamed up um, with LACMA, with Pillow Montoya from, from LACMA, um, where we had originally done 
uh, two programs in the galleries. This was before the pandemic started, before the quarantine. So we were able to pull off a couple sessions at, um, it's basically it's yoga that's centered around the art that's on exhibition. So um, I would go in, it's kind of like a curatorial talk in some ways, but it's incorporated with movement. So um, I, I like went in there and I like studied the work of Rufino Tamayo and I studied the works that they had up there. And then I went back with my collaborator, Rebecca Plevin. She's a certified yoga teacher. And we started talking about the work and the movements that we could do that go with it. And um, so what happens in the gallery is that people show up and we talk to them about the work there and we talk to them about the feelings and the movements that are displayed in there. And we start to embody those through the yoga. We did a couple sessions like that and people, it was interesting afterwards because people would walk around and they would see the work differently and you could, they would come back and they'd be like, Hey, I, I didn't know this or, you know, and it was really cool to see that that's another form of learning, you know, mm -hmm. like, like we listen or, or we, you know, we do, there's different ways to learn. And so that was just another way to like teach people. Yeah. Um, guided snack hour was, uh, that that's with, that's kind of like a branch off of the experimental quesadilla lab. Um, and that was working with Prene Reddy at LA art Corps. It was kind of like, it, it felt like kind of like a call in variety show in some ways where like people would come and, and like, you know, I'd bring them on the call with me and it'd be like, all right, what do you have in your kitchen? You know, let's see, open up the cabinets. And then we'd start to talk about that. And then there'd be like this brainstorming going on in the chat. And then I would start to brainstorm and be like, well, you know, what do you want? Like savory, sweet, you know, and we would like build a snack together because um, you get used to what you have at home and you start to just kind of stay with the same combinations. Mm -hmm. But when you bring in other people and they have this other lens on it, it's like, oh, you do have other options and possibilities. It's just that it's not something that like immediately came to you. And so a lot of this also comes from like, just maybe you just don't have money to go to the grocery store, you know, and, and maybe we don't have a lot of foods in there and we're tired of it. But if we can come together as a community, at least we can figure out a way to like freshen up what we're eating to get us through just a little bit further, a little bit more imagination, a little bit more creativity. And do you ever struggle with finding inspiration? And if so, how do you overcome those roadblocks? Wow. Um, you know, it's interesting because I've been so much in practice with like workshops and social practice that I haven't been drawing or painting as, as much. Mm -hmm. And that's been something where I've just been like, oh my God, what do I draw? What am I going to do? You know? Mm -hmm. And, and that's when I just have to be like, all right, just, you know, just start, start anything, draw, draw the chihuahua, draw a damn chihuahua, draw, it, you, know? <laughs> you know, and it's like, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Nobody has to see it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That, that switching between things sometimes like, but they inform each other. So I'm going to be showing some drawings with chihuahuas in them next month. <laughs> <laughs> what do you hope people feel when they look at your art? One thing I want people to feel is like this sense of like, I can do that. Mm. Like in some ways, like I want them to be like, I can make art too. I can, you know, even though sometimes people use that like as an insult in some ways, or they'll be like, oh, my kid can do that. It's like, mm. good. Like let, let your kid do it. You do it. Do it with your kid, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. That's one thing that's like meaningful to me. Um, and then also just, just, yeah, the, the potential, you know, of like, you know, maybe I'm imagining something new or a new world, or I'm reinterpreting an experience or something like that, but just to, to, you know, have this sense of like imagination for a second. So before we end, we have some rapid fire questions to ask. The first question is, what is your favorite color? My go-to for that is always purple. When are you the happiest? I feel like when I'm teaching. If you could have three people dead or alive for dinner, who would it be? Uh, my grandma Esther, for one. Um, let me see. Uh, probably her dad, uh, my great-grandfather. 
Uh, my third person would be um, Teresa in 25 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd have yeah, her I like her. that. Yeah, yeah, I like that. <laughs> um, what do you want your legacy to be? Um, wow, wow, wow. Like, like kind of like she she did the best with what she had. <laughs> <laughs> Because I, I mean, I have, I, who knows what I have, you know, but like, she really tried. If you could spend a day in someone else's shoes, who would it be and why? Um, I, you know what, I, I would like lately, um, I've been hanging out with uh, my friends, Ernesto and Mercedes and Ernesto Irena, he's a, he's a printmaker. I would, I would be in Ernesto's shoes for a day just to, just cause he's, he's at a whole other level. Yeah. <laughs> What is a book that you have read recently or are currently reading that you would recommend? I've been reading this book called Fix Your Period, but it's Dr. Nicole Jardim. And she's um, maybe like 10 or 15 years ahead of the curve with uh, period science, medical knowledge about this. Like a lot of a lot of what she writes about and talks about isn't going to make it to like the mainstream for many years, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, And so she talks about just like how the foods we eat affect our allergies and like how our pain levels are or our comfort levels. Nobody, especially for teens, like nobody gives you any kind of like instruction manual or really informs you on like, hey, forever, you know, for the next 28 days of the rest of maybe all of your life or whatever, um, your body is going to go through all these cycles and you have to find a way to adapt to them. Um, so those, that book has been really enlightening. Thank you so much, Teresa. We learned a lot about you. Thank you for taking your time out of your day to sit down with us and talk. Can you let everyone at home know about any upcoming projects and where they could connect with you? Thanks for taking the time to speak with me and giggle at my jokes. (laughs) (laughs) Um, it's really meaningful to, to be able to talk about my work. Uh, so I have a couple of upcoming projects. The first one is in South LA at El Nido Family Center. Um, and it's part of my artist in residency uh, for the city of LA. And I'm working with teenagers there. And it's, yeah. And so I'm working with um, Aura Vasquez, who is from Ready to Help. Um, it's a mutual aid and community network. And then I'm working with a writer who's worked with Fox and many other networks and um and that's Maxwell Kessler and Jamal Mallory McCree who's uh, I think he was on Quantico I don't I, I don't know everybody's resume anyway he's an actor <laughs> and a producer and I'm working with with the three of them and we're going to talk about like storytelling and how to create films that are around social justice issues and how to use those films to leverage power in your community, create change. And then also next week, I'm working in Santa Monica through their Art of Recovery Initiative and I'm doing the latest iteration of the Experimental Quesadilla Lab. And I'm pretty excited about that. It's taking on a whole other form and so that's going to be open to the public. So, and the first 30 people, I think within the community who um, like sign up for the workshops, I'll have a, a quesadilla box to give. And then I'll have more boxes available for purchase if anybody just like wants to take one home and make their own quesadillas. But um, yeah, that's going to be fun and interesting. And we're going to have like a yoga aspect in there and an art making component. So it's kind of, kind of a wellness program, but I've like mixed it up. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again. Thank you. We really loved talking to you and yeah, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Thank you both for having me. Thank you. Bye.